This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. We are back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast, and uh, we're continuing on looking at uh, glacial outbursts and uh, yokel alps, whether or not ice can hold in large amounts of water, like the the ice dam theory says about the end of the Younger Dryas. So we're going to continue with that, Randall. Where were we last week? Well, we've been, yeah, we've been talking about the stability of ice dams and yeah. we kind of covered the uh, little bit of the background, which is that the Little Ice Age glaciers uh, between the, say, the 1300s and the 1800s swelled to their largest size in over 10,000 years. And then with the shrinkage back, the, the, the melting back of the Little Ice Age glaciers, there were uh, a series of lakes that were formed, sometimes impounded by other glacier ice and sometimes impounded by moraine. And then as the glaciers continued to shrink, the lakes grew until finally whatever the enclosing medium was, whether it was ground moraine or ice, could no longer retain those pressures. And these impounded bodies of water were suddenly released in the form of outburst floods, which in the Icelandic is referred to as Jokalaups, Jokalaups. And I may not be pronouncing it exactly correctly, but it's pretty close, close enough for an American, I figure. So anyhow, yeah, so that's what we've been looking at. And um, talking about floods, particularly in reference to the great, Terminal Ice Age floods, which have been an ongoing theme of our explorations on this particular podcast. Um, the whole issue that we've been kind of um, circling about is the idea of the very rapid and catastrophic melting of the great ice sheets. So we've been exploring various areas of the continent. Um, and now we've kind of come back around to the Pacific Northwest of the United States, and we're looking or have been looking at the Channel Scab Lands and the formation of Lake Missoula. And we learned that Lake Missoula and its outburst floods were at least three orders of magnitude larger than any historic outburst floods. And so I raised the question whether it was reasonable to simply extrapolate up from a modern, much, much smaller version to the scale of Lake Missoula and its outburst floods. And that was the kind of the question I raised that has been hovering over us here as we've been looking at uh, various examples of things that may have bearing one way or another on this question. And speaking of the Scablands, if we is the uh, upcoming Scablands tour? Am I understanding it correctly that this is all sold out now? That's been confirmed, yeah. And I believe we're talking about uh, a fall tour where we take in the eastern realm of the Great Floodlands. Is this correct? That our well, good we're looking spring at next bearing? spring. Yeah, next spring, late spring, oh, early next summer. spring. Yeah, not the fall. Yeah, okay, next spring. We're looking at um, Western Montana. That's right. Uh, Panhandle of Idaho. I kind of think, would you agree with this, Brad, when we think about the two realms of these floods, we kind of think the Western realm is primarily Eastern Washington, and we could probably include in the Western realm the uh, the Columbia Gorge. Down through down the gorge, right. The Eastern realm would be Western Montana, and basically what in the framework of the conventional models would have been the lake basin and the ice dam area. I would kind of think, do you think about it, uh, uh, that making that dividing line, or sort of arbitrary dividing line would be pretty much Lake Pend Oreille? Well, that's of what lake I was going to say. The, the Purcell Trench lobe 
Yeah. It's kind of the divider, you know, yeah, where the right. water was backed up and then the wa- where the water was released and flowed out. Right. That that's to me makes kind of sense. We almost got up there. We did get up into the uh uh Rathdrum Prairie, bottom end of the Rathdrum Prairie, which would have been just below Ponderé and would have been under the ice dam when we were uh when we had our trip in the spring. Yeah, we just crossed the uh over the Idaho border from Washington. So yeah, you can see up the Spokane Valley mm-hmm. and the Rathdrum Prairie. And that would have been, yeah, the extent of the the glacial lobe coming down there through the Purcell Trench and past where Lake Ponderay is now, whether there was any kind of body of water back then under the ice. Yeah, that's a big question. Right. So And before we move on here, I have to say it kind of looks like a familiar country there behind you, Randall. Well, what am I um, looking at there? What I've got on my backdrop here is Canyon Lake Gorge. That's okay. That's why those trees. Yeah, that whole landscape looks really. Uh, you recognize those trees, didn't you? I do recognize the trees and the whole. Yeah, the way the land looks. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what? What? What's the deal with Canyon Lake Gorge? Ah, uh, well, it was I guess catastrophically created in a very short amount of time in a recent flood. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. We're so we need to get out there and... soon. That's right. I'm going to be out, out your way, out. and we're going to go have a little, little trek over that uh, terrain because that terrain was at 93. I was thinking 2003. I think yeah, it was 2004. 2003. Or two... 2003. I think Brad's right. Yeah. Yeah. There was a heavy rain, and the reservoir you see in the in the background, yep, right? Canyon there, Lake back there, over top, yeah, overflowed. And basically, in three days, created an entire suite of channel scab land like features. Yeah, it, I remember it, that flood. It was pretty intense yeah. here, too. And yeah. what's interesting about the landscape, the carving, the erosion and sedimentation that it did, has led some of the geomorphologists and geologists looking at it to rethink the formation of things like plunge pools and, and, yeah. Things that were assumed to have taken a long time, and here they are duplicated within a matter of a couple of days. Right. From one That's event. Right. Yep. Yeah. Hey, keep that keep that mic up. Keep that mic up on your right, right here. On your face there. There you go. Okay, That's but good. we don't want my, my whiskers. <laughs> yeah, here, no right? no beard mic. But, no uh, beard yeah. mics. Okay. I'll, I'll try my best. All um, right. Yeah, I probably should trim this back then, shouldn't I? Because... Yeah, just shave it off. Uh, shave it uh. off. Yeah, I can't do that. What was is that Todd the cat? What just ran past you there? Uh I think it was larger than a cat. <laughs> okay. I couldn't tell. Quite a bit larger Va- it than it vanished a cat. into the hill country. That's all I know. There was a ripple in the matrix there. <laughs> yeah, because in case anybody's wondering, I'm not really sitting up on a high prominence overlooking Canyon Lake Gorge. <laughs> right. But Brad, you really oh, I was supposed to figure out where you were. Let's see. It looks a little bit swampy and marshy. Um Yeah, almost gave it away a minute ago. Um Uh-oh. Of course I've got you in a thumbnail, so it's hard see, to see. See, folks, you're what you're seeing here is like this is a little behind the scenes. They put up these these backgrounds and then they quiz each other on where they are. It's pretty funny to watch. Now this is happening live. So where is he at, Randall? Um <laughs> Let's see. Lake Ponderé. <laughs> I, yeah, that would be my guess. about what I was going to guess. I was going to guess it's near the outlet of the dam because it's pretty marshy there um, at the far western end of the Clark Fork River just before it goes into Lake Ponderé. So that was going to be my guess. I'm thinking that um, we're looking uh, – this would be – the main ice dam would have been behind us, and we're looking east. Okay, that was that was the background a couple of shows ago. So I'm not I'm wrong. That's this is it. I'm I'm on the north side of uh, Lake Ponderay. Oh, the north side. So this okay. is up in the Purcell Trench. So this is so yeah, we're almost, looking. Uh, okay, so the the looking the, south toward that that wall back there would have been, you know, the big vertical range that you know yeah. the, the the ice uh, lobe jammed into that they they you know, presume made right. it enough of a seal to block back the, the big lake. Right. So the outflow would have been, you said we're looking to the north. No, we're looking to the south. Looking south. So the so outflow actually, would have been to your, well, to the left side of the screen, which is your right. 
Outflow, no, that would, damn would have been back there. Outflow going down that way. It's confusing because of the mirroring and everything that happens with Zoom. It's, yeah, it's weird. Yep, well, so it's uh, it's where the Pack River comes in. Okay. Very north, uh, east east side of uh, Lake Ponderay. Yeah, so we're still in Idaho here, but yeah, really, yeah. really close to the... Uh, okay. And behind the, us the is the door to the underworld. That's right. It's just a black, this black square, nothingness. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, the mirror. That's mirrored. where our studio is. Um, yeah. Well, this, this is how we go home. You know, back, we're looking back into hell. You're yeah. looking south t- across the river Styx. <laughs> mm-hmm. I see it. I see it. Well, I've always believed. Uh, it's always been part of my philosophy of life to avoid the void whenever possible. <laughs> avoid, I avoid uh, the avoid. void. Okay, 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 very good. Got it. Yeah. Avoid. See the word avoid. Yes. Is telling you avoid the yeah. void. Well, avoid it. <laughs> oh, Domino's pizza. I'm reminded blood. from the, the words of wisdom of R. Crumb when his uh, character, the Cloyd, avoid the avoid the void, Cloyd. You remember Cloyd? No, never mind. That was a long time. That was in another universe. R. Crumb, way back. Does yeah. Mike know what he's talking about? I, I didn't keep up with pop culture even back then. I know. <laughs> I know who R. Crumb is. I just don't know uh, Cloyd. Avoid the Cloyd. But it was. <laughs> he had uh, some interesting characters. In fact, I just recently bought a. Uh, believe it or not, R. Crumb illustrated the Book of Genesis, all fifty chapters. Really? Yes. Oh, I just cool. just bought a copy of it. It's amazing work. Uh, I'm sure it is. It's wow. <laughs> it's very graphic. Uh huh. All right. I, wow. Yeah. Well, that's not what. Yeah. I mean, when I was reading it, like the Adventures of Schumann, the Human, and uh, Mister Natural, <laughs> and Flaky Funt. You remember Flaky, don't you? Yes. Okay, well, okay, so that's not where we were going to go tonight. We're, <laughs> right, that's um, not what the podcast Mike was about. a little bit closer with, like, you know, maybe there's a, probably a flood involved in his book. <laughs> yeah, in Genesis, there's a flood in there. But now we're wandering way well, off. Well, no, he, actually, he did have a, 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 car, a prophetic cartoon, um, and it was a, a, a flaky foot type character. He's running, holding his hands over his head, and there's a... Um, a meteor shower, and he's going, Mein Gott! Some, oh, rocks are falling from the sky, and he's running. Uh, <laughs> the picture is like 50 years old in my brain, but it's still there. I can still see that guy. Uh, I bet you Kyle could probably find that image before the mein show is over. <laughs> Coont. Oh no, this is what it was. Mein Gott, swasticles falling from the sky. <laughs> that was what it was. The swasticles, see. And this was before Carl Sagan proposed that the origin of the swasticle was an outgassing comet nuclei with jets, huh. you know, prominent jets spewing out from it as it rotated very quickly. So, anyhow. Sounds like- Sounds like good stories for children. Yeah. Well, yeah. So um, that's what I was reading instead of doing my homework. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we've been talking about uh, the mega floods out in um, in Washington and Missoula, and I think I should go ahead pull up a map. So people can see what we are talking about here. All right. So I'll put Lake Ponderay right in the center of the screen. And I'm going to zoom on in. So Bradley, your background, what you're telling me is that photo is taken up here somewhere and we're looking south. Uh, Right where that Odin is. Right here. To the right of that, that little inlet there, that's the yeah. that's where I'm at right there. That's where you're at. Okay, so yeah, and then we're looking at the the, the Bitterroot. I think this is the northern end of the Bitterroot range right here. I looked it up a month ago, but I don't remember. I, th- I think that's what There's it is. There's a specific so, so, name yeah. for that range right there. That's the mountain range that we see on the horizon right behind your head. Correct. Okay. 
All right. So, okay. So this would have been, yeah, this would have been right under the Purcell Trench lobe. I'm looking as I'm zooming in here, I'm seeing, looks like some kind of almost incipient drumlinizing effect yeah. going on here a bit, doesn't it? Definitely. Yeah. I wonder what the bottom of the lake looks like. Well, you know, down here is where that deep, that thousand foot deep, 11 foot hundred deep trench is right in here. Hmm. And I've always been intrigued by this. It's this circular. Circular. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah. So then here's the Clark Fork. And this would have been the outlet, the, uh, the single outlet for draining all of these reservoirs, all of these basins back here. So the Mission Basin is what I'm circling with my, my mouse right here. That was filled with water. And then all of this down here where we see Arley and then all of this area down to Missoula, right here in Missoula, it was almost 1,000 feet deep. And then all the way down here to the south end of the Bitterroot Valley, I think we uh, determined that where Hamilton is, it was still, the water was still a couple of hundred feet deep. So it would have been back flooding into all of these, these tributary valleys here that you see coming in on either side. So there's a whole lot of research work that could be done by exploring into these tributaries here. Stay um, right, stay right there. Go a little bit south, Randall. Uh, just because we brought it up several times, that Lake Como is down there on the. This is Lake Como. There you go. Yeah, right. there it is. Yep. Yeah, because you we, guys well, that's been... where we looked at the strand lines yep. with that being released to uh, you know help irrigate the valley down there. Hmm. Right. Have you guys been to Flathead Lake in any of your trips? Oh yeah. Mm, yeah. Multiple, multiple times. times. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading that it's like some of the clearest freshwater lakes in the world. Is that right? Uh, I haven't seen any tests, but uh, yeah, certainly what I recall is that it was a very clear lake where you could okay. you know, see yeah. the bottom very clearly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we have stayed. It's the, it's the largest naturally impounded uh, freshwater lake uh, west of the Mississippi or west of the Great Lakes. Something like I used to know exactly what it was, but. It's in the it's in the glacially scoured basin. Yeah, and you see this right here. Here's the town of Polson. We've we've stayed right here, right on the lake, and um, you and, see this. And yeah, you're you're running through some of the places that uh, that I'm putting on the itinerary for this trip next spring or next June. Very cool. All right. Well, you see all this hummocky, hilly stuff here is moraine. So that was moraine that was deposited by the Flathead Lobe because all of this area, which is now occupied by Flathead Lake, was filled with ice. It was all part of the Flathead Lobe. And a couple of sublobes kind of forked off here to the, to the west. And you can actually see, I think we have looked at some of this, but it never hurts to revisit some of these places just to get a clearer picture. Here is the um, the Elmo Moraine right here. So there was a lobe of ice, a sublobe that came off the main flathead lobe right here. Then there was another sublobe that came through Big Arm. Another sublobe that actually came all the way up here like this. That's pretty wild looking. And then here is Chief Cliff. Now we'll we'll get back and we'll be looking at some of this stuff right here because it's pretty interesting. Um, and I we we we've covered this area several times. Uh, and here you can see where the highway, when building the highway, they've utilized this natural breach within the terminal mooring. You see that because this was an outlet right here. So when the ice began to melt back. Meltwater streams breached the moraine here, and a major flow came down. You can see the scour holes, the troughs right here. Here was a pathway that was uh, where the water flowed between the, the land and the glacier. So right in here was a trough, and you can just think of it that you had the, the glacier here to the, to the east, and you had the mountainous or hills to the left. And in that trough between the two, there was a major gush of meltwater. It came down this way and then 
breached this ridge right here. You can see where the, the breach took place. Here's a 500 foot cliff that is a, um, that was created by this, this breaching. And then the, but then the water, see, turned to the west because it hit the um, Elmo sublobe right here. So the Elmo sublobe blocked all of this, which diverted the water, the, the stream to the west. And it came down and wrapped around. You can see right here, this is where the glacier came. The, the tongue of the glacier came down this way. So you had the water wrapping around here. Coming down and we're Highway 28 now is the water flowed to the west. Then there was a breach right here. Now, I would guess that that breach, you see, when the when the uh, ice first began to melt back, um, it's likely that Flathead Lake was much deeper. And in fact, it may have it may have actually spilled over right here and then then downcut this channel that you see right here that. The 28 is now utilizing because, you know, it's much easier just to go through that already, that trough that's been excavated there rather than go over the hill, um, which is formed by the moraine. So here you can kind of decipher the story and you can reconstruct how this glacier lobe would have looked coming like this, around like this, like this, and then it came down this way. And it's kind of hard to detect where. Because look at this, this whole thing here is probably a breach. You see, like this is more rain up here and this is more rain down here, but it's like, like not a continuous elongated hill. You see, it's kind of broken. There was probably a, uh, a breach right so, here where 93 comes through. What's the source of the ice for all that? Is it, is some of it coming off the mountains off to the east there, or is it just some of it probably from... is, but you see okay. from here, you've got a picture that that, valley which is the rocky mountain trench yeah. is completely filled with ice going all the way up here and in fact all of this terrain is pretty much buried under ice and all you've got okay. left all you've got is the nunataks or nunataks right poking up above the ice but and then there's and I haven't looked in a while if i'm sorry if i remember correctly there there there's some drumlin looking features in that swan valley uh to the right there of the flathead basin to the right of the mission mountains yeah, let's see. Uh, there we go. Yeah, yeah it's, there you yeah, go. Yeah, look at this. So, yeah, it's it's very tree totally covered. So yeah, I went down there a couple of times, and yeah, I could never really see anything. Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah I haven't been down here yet, so I've I've really been curious about what exactly happened here. I, I'm guessing it was filled with ice, so it was not an arm of so-called Lake Missoula. But, and, and catastrophic outflows at the southern end of it there. Like, you're, yeah, you're seeing it. Right here, yeah. yeah. I've been through there a couple of times. Yeah, that would make, yeah. Let's see, where would it have? You get down into the, uh, oh, that would be like the Vegas Valley or something down there. Uh, yep, there's a huge area that we still haven't explored. The, the evidence is everywhere. Uh, but I, you were you were showing the, where the lobe was and uh it was actually episode 68 that that we went kind of in detail uh, and you've got a nice graphic where you put in the uh uh marshmallowy looking uh glacier there to to match those outlines you were drawing out on the map so yeah if people are coming in new to this uh, that's one you get a lot more detail if you check back on episode 68 i think this is what All you're right. talking about that's the one that's the very one yeah yeah, those are big marshmallows. Those are, yeah. <laughs> well, cotton candy, cotton candy. Excuse me. Well, this is the al this flows. is one of the alternate theories: is that actually it was not glacial ice; it was actually marshmallow cream. <laughs> this is the Michelin Man from a catastrophic event that was um, is what inspired the uh, the climax of the original Ghostbusters. Right. Um, stay puffed. Yep. The Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. That's right. Yep. Well, here, look, I can, I can, I'll, I'll toggle back and forth. Let me see. Oh, here we go. This is it. All right. By toggling back and forth, you can kind of see the configuration of the ice. And if we look right up here, this is where meltwater came through here. Now, see, this is important because here's the deal right here. 
this area would have been about roughly a thousand feet deep. So given that the high water uh, line is at about 4,200, actually there's some, there's a little bit of evidence that suggests that it briefly got as high as 4,250 feet above sea level. But that's the datum line. Keep that in your mind. Just round number, 4,200 feet above sea level. So all throughout the basin of Lake Missoula, that line and evidence of that high water line can be found. And it always coincides with right at 4,200 feet above sea level. So if this right here, the floor of the Mission Valley is 3,200 feet above sea level, you can easily conclude that the water was 1,000 feet deep there. Uh huh. So, but one of the things that that we we need to consider here is that when you look at the the complexity of the basin. Oh, and by the way, there's there's the image from. Oh yeah, Lake Como. When we were out here. Now, what's interesting about this is all of this is moraine up here that's now got forest on it, and all of this, all this bouldery stuff here would have been exposed as Lake Como eroded the shoreline that is composed of this ancient moraine, maybe from the Little Ice Age. I haven't seen the dating on it, but you can actually, if you look up here, you can actually see that there are huge rocks and boulders embedded within the, within the ground mass. So that's, that's clearly moraine, a moraine terrace up here that's now got forest growing on it. So at one point, this would, this place was filled with glaciers. And all of this was embedded within that moraine. And then as the shoreline was eaten back, eroded back by Lake Como, it exposed all of this stuff. And then when we were here, it was during a drought year. So you can see the recession of the lake, which to me is important because we can we know that these shorelines are created by one event. They're not, each of these shorelines isn't a separate filling of Lake Como. So in other words, you say, okay, well, here's, here's the full pool of Lake Como, this line right here, let's say. Okay, well, then it drained away and another lake formed and its shoreline was here. Then it drained, drained away, the basin refilled, and its shoreline was here and so on until there's, you know, the lake is gone. Is it that, or is was this one, one lake that that receded and left a succession of shorelines? What do you yeah, think, Kyle? I I think that it's the sing a single filling, and then the it's the draining that leaves the strand lines. I mean, I see this every day. Yep. Yeah, yeah. On our new pond at at the vineyard, we fill it up. And it's still saturating the soil, and you come back a couple of days later, and there's a set of strand lines. Mm -hmm, yeah. Then it rains, and it refills, and those strand lines are washed away. Are washed away. Yeah. So you, when you there's see those set you, you every see, time, you see multiple strand strand lines, but you know from a single draining, a single event. Yeah. Right. So right. then, when we look at at this. I mean, I've seen the assumption made in some of the literature that each of these shorelines is a completely separate, independent filling of the Missoula Basin. That's ridiculous. And, of course, then that, without too much, uh, you know, examination of the veracity or, um, you know, believability of this idea, the assumption is is each individual filling is a separate lake which is a separate damming by a reformed ice dam yeah. in the Purcell Trench. The thing that, that and there would be fifty to one hundred years separating each event, each of these events. It would have been remarkable to have them all with such such precise regularity. De yes, a declining, you know, declining regularity. Yeah, well, each, each one is successive a little bit flood is just a little bit less than the preceding one. The dam just wasn't as good. The dams are, you know, they're obviously getting worse as time goes on because now they can only dam up. They you know. don't dam it like they used to. <laughs> no, apparently but the not. Thing that, the thing that uh, is interesting about these strand lines to me is how are they still there after 
12,000 years or however long it's been. It's so it, it seems like there must have been pretty significant wave action to create each one of those uh, as it was draining. I mean, if it drained very quickly, I'm, I'm wondering how did it dig those so deep that they are still there? Well, after 12,000 years. Well, I would think that if we were able to be hovering in a UFO on above all of this, watching it, that what we would see is that there is, uh, you know, this effort to drain this entire lake out through the Clark Fork Valley. So you're going to have, um, you're not going to have a smooth, uniform, continuous flow out. Be so in other words, these are, these are uh, analogous to the rhythmites on the other end. In a sense, yes. That's how, that's how I would interpret it. That, that, you know, the lake will, level will stabilize for a period of time, and I'm guessing probably not more than a few days at the most. And downstream, somewhere 50 miles, 100 miles downstream, a blockage moves through. You know, you've got major blockages, as we'll look on the map. Um, hey, what? Let's let's stop to share, and I'll, we'll go back to um, go back to the map. And it still is surprising to me how how regular they are, but uh, um, okay, let's look. I at mean, that. I guess even the even on small ponds, they're pretty regular. But I, I wonder what the mechanism is. Well, you saw that um, there on Lake Como. Uh, you know, they were, they were fairly regular those those strand lines, but right. The point is, is that you, you know, again, we're seeing a process that's not so smooth that it it leaves no distinct trace. We're seeing yeah. a process that takes place in a, you know, a concentrated set of phases. Um, and and if you look here, if we we follow now, we're going to go back to Clark Fork. Now the assumption is, is you've got all of this area back here. You've got all of this area in here, all the way back down Bitterroot Valley, and it's all ultimately coming through the Clark Fork Valley and then discharging south and presumably cutting this deep trough of Lake Ponderé and then discharging out here. We came right up into this area. That was about as far as we got on our spring tour. Um, so we were like right in the downstream outlet. Um, but we can also see there was a, a substream that actually flowed off this way. Um, and you had flows that came down and you had, a, you had a diversion here to the north and to the south. So the one that led to the south created the Cheney Palouse. If I go to the map view, I mean the, the satellite view, you'll see the head of Cheney Palouse right here. And then here was another outlet, which, which is now occupied by the Spokane River right here. So if we go back and we look at, now again, these distal res reservoirs held most of the water volume that uh, formed Lake Missoula. But if you look here, like where Pardee did his calculations of peak discharge and came up with a passage of about 9.6 cubic miles per hour. We pointed this out right here. He used this little straight reach of what's called eddy narrows. Now you can see here, notice that you've got an open basin, right? So this whole thing is filled with water and this water is coming into this flume that's much narrower. So what has to happen, see, is that the water is going to pick up a tremendous amount of force because of, of the, the conservation of flow volume. In other words, at some point, uh, like if you go to a, a typical stream and you measure over a period of, say, one day, um, now this is going to change, of course, like if you have a, a major rainfall and now the volume of water is increasing. You know, you will not have a steady flow. You will not have a uniform flow. If you take take a, a, a flow gauge and you measure the, the discharge at one point, say, and then 
as the water is falling over the catchment basin, the creek is rising, you take a second reading, you know, hours later, and it's going to be it's going to be a, a much greater volume, a much larger Q value, a much larger discharge going through there. But barring that, a change in external circumstances, like there are times when you could go out and, and measure the volume of a creek or a river one day and come back the next day, and it'll pretty much be the same. Okay, so now in that period of uniform flow, the, ch- the water that's flowing through the channel, now this channel is not a uniform culvert it's it's nature so there's places where the channel is constricted places where it is where it opens up and so you can see right here look here by thompson falls you have a major opening in the channel from what you have in eddy narrows this is called eddy narrows after the town of eddy see well if you were to measure discharge across this point say during the peak of the flood and at the same time you were to measure the discharge across this much narrower valley, you would still, you would have had basically the same volume of water flowing past both places. Okay, well, the fact that the cross section here is larger than this place means that the water is going to be moving slower, right? And then as the valley constricts, the water has to deepen, doesn't it? Because it's the same amount of water. Well, the other thing that happens is that the water speeds up, right? It slows, it speeds up through constrictions, slows down in openings, in basins. So look here, you've got a basin, basin here, a basin here, separated by this narrow constricted valley here, the eddy narrows. So Part E saw that this was the ideal place to try to measure the discharge of water. And the assumption, of course, is that Whatever the flow was through here would be basically the same all the way up. Although notice you've got another constriction up here, and then it opens into a basin. And if you come down here, you'll notice you've got a wide open basin here. Come down, and there's Eddy Narrows. And if we go then look over here, you've got constrictions here, see? And you've got water that's coming up out of the Bitterroot Valley, and it's actually backing up into the Nine Mile Creek Valley here, but it's also filling all of this area. And then if we zoom down here, you've got a constricted valley, opens up into a basin right here. If we come over to this side, we've got a larger basin here coming into this constricted valley here. This is called the Alberton Narrows. And there's the Nine Mile Creek outcrop that's right along 90, or you can see it from the road, that has been correlated with the Tushi beds at Burlingame Canyon and interpreted as meaning each one of those layers is a separate filling and draining of Lake Missoula. Uh, and that has been questioned, and I have to agree with that, that it makes no sense. And uh, let me see if I can show you why here. Um, by going to this, let's see if we can go through go through this. So, is the point about the the constrictions and the openings and all that kind of stuff that that it takes on sort of a rhythmic pattern? Yes. Of drainage is that what the point? Yes, okay. that there's you got it. That's the whole point right there. Is that is that what what it is? It's not going to be a smooth continuous draining. It's going to be it's going to be pauses and interruptions. Um, and, and other th- also, if it goes around a, a sharp bend, and if we go back and look at the map, which we'll do in a, in a second. All right. So here we are in Eddy Narrows. And one of the, th- one of the things that you can see here is the, the, the texture of the, the bedrock on the sides and how it comes down. And you can almost see where it, it, it comes down one angle. If you were to project this angle out, you can see that right at this point, this inflection point, this angle changes in sharpness, doesn't it? Right? In other words, yeah. this is steeper, and this is not quite as steep. And then you get up here, and you'll notice that right up in this area, well, if I draw this line right here, above there you have full foresting, and below it you have this bare, scoured bedrock. And so basically, this is right up at the 4,200 feet above sea level line right up here. So. At the, at the peak of the flood, 
this was this whole valley was filled with water here. And when we look at the cliff faces along the flanks of the Clark Fork, and I think this is still in Eddy Narrows, um, you know, look at the texture of the rock. This is this has been subject to very powerful shear forces. Look at this, and, and look at, you can see Russell Alt down here for scale at the bottom. But wow. this, this cliff would have been completely overtopped, water flowing from right to left. And it's, it's created this very rough, scoured texture on the surface of the rock. In other words, it's not just a smooth outfacing of, of rock. It eventually will be if nothing, if nothing affects this but modern rates of erosion. You come back in probably a hundred, couple hundred thousand years, and this will be a relatively smooth cliff. And now we're getting close to where this presumed ice dam would be. And there's something, now this is, this is an interesting, this is a gravel deposit. Now, when we, I'm going to do stop share. I'll go back to um, my map. Now, if you think about this, you've got these huge flows that are coming down the main valley. Well, as long as the tributary valleys aren't filled with glacial ice, and if they've melted or the glacial ice is, is cleared out for whatever process or reason, you'll have back floods that will wash up into these valleys, and they will wash up basically to that high water level. And they're going to be choked with sediment. It's going to be basically like a tidal bore rushing upstream until it gets to that high water mark. And then as soon as the water level in the main valley starts to drop, the water level in the tributary valleys will drop along with it. But when it does, it leaves behind the evidence of this onrush of water up the valley temporary stopping, and then reversing flow and flowing back out. So that is um, what we are looking at right here. So you can find these, these tributary valleys are choked with this kind of stuff. So like here, you're, I'm standing on a pile of it. This is Bradley down here. The main valley is down here, but you can't see it. It's just around this hill. So this was a rush of water that back flooded up this tributary and then basically stopped at this point. Probably stabilized at this point for however long it took the water level in the main Clark Fork to drop, say, let's say a couple of days or something in that range, and then the water would have flowed back out, leaving this stuff behind right here. So, again, this is diagnostic. This is one way you trace, you know, you can trace the pathways of these ancient floods by looking at this suite of evidence, both erosional and depositional, that these cataclysmic floods will leave in, their, uh, in the aftermath. And then, now here's something that I'm going to point out to you that is not quite consistent with the um, with the main models. Okay, so let's pull out here. Now, if we go right here where the dam was, now if we go, let's see, right here at the Cabinet Gorge Dam. All right, so here's Cabinet Gorge Dam, and there's a, there's a, uh, a, a pull over here with an overlook with a sign basically saying that this is roughly the position of the ice dam. So Idaho, Montana state line to the east of here would have been lake to the west of here would have been glacier ice. Um, but when we get down in here on the south side, there's a series of creeks, I believe. Let's see here. Okay, so let's see. I believe that right there is the gravel pit. 
Okay, so. Um, yeah, so that was a, a backwash. But then down here on the mouth of the uh, of these tributary creeks, there's a series of valley trains. Now, okay, given the scenario, ice dam here to the to the west, lake to the east, ice dam gives way, lake is draining. The draining of the lake would have been from the southeast to the northwest, correct? In other words, the draining of this reservoir is moving in this direction here, right? Here's the draining, northwest. So the evidence of flow should be indicating that the main flow, if not all the flow, is going to be from southeast to northwest because it's the draining of the lake, right? Yeah. Okay, so now... I'm going to go back to go to the next slide. Now this is the white pine gravel pit, and this is huge masses of flood deposits that are along the south flank of Clark Fork River Valley. Okay, now here's what I want to call your attention to. You'll notice that. These strata are not horizontal, right? Look at, can you see this? There's a there's a de very definite observable tilt. I see it. Yes. Um, see, I think we can see it. Yeah, here we go. This is say, look at this area up here. You can see this tilt is from tilting down towards the left. Just remember now, when you have uh, four sets like this, the tilt direction or the dip, that direction is down current, right? So when you look at this, because it's tilting down from right to left, it means the current flow was from right to left, right? You understand that? Okay. Yep. And here we can see it very clearly. Here's, here's the, the down dipping strata, the four sets that are showing these, this is paleo current indicators here. So by looking at this, this tells you which way the water was flowing. Okay, so this is the white pipe, white pine gravel pit. This is now we go further, uh, further towards Lake Ponderé, and we get to the Dry Creek gravel pit. Um, we'll come back to this quote in a minute. Okay, here we go. Here's here's the Dry Creek gravel pit right here, and we've got a valley train coming off in this mouth. White pine is down here. Um, I will pause for a minute. Dang it, Todd. I think, I think Todd the cat is upset. <laughs> he doesn't like, well, he doesn't like where we're going with this. He's telling us to take a break. <laughs> yeah, we'll take a break and come back. I'll, okay, let's take a break. I'll go ahead and kill Todd, and then we'll, <laughs> no, I wouldn't do it. Todd, I'm just kidding. But God, Todd, you sure get annoying sometimes. <laughs> That's right. Wait a minute. Wait All right. A minute. Okay, come here. <laughs> so everybody here's todd there he is look at that guy hey oh <laughs> big old fuzz butt yeah yeah good boy. okay say, say right. hello to the people todd he's saying screw that let me get outside all right all right see you all after right. we'll see be... you in a minute yeah we'll be, we'll right, be back. right back So then he's arguing what you're arguing, that the flows are No, he's in. not. He's just stating it, that it's flowing the wrong way and doesn't... Doesn't consider what that means. Doesn't yeah. consider what that means. Right. Right. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, let's see. Before we get back into uh, wherever you were going <laughs> with the whole thing about the floods, uh, we want to mention CBDfromthegods.com. Please go to the website, check out their products. They've got some good literature there on on uh, what they do, what they're all about. Um, Randall, you got anything? Uh, no, to report? last last episode we um, we shared the unboxing of my latest supply kit, so I'm good now. I'm covered. Um, right on. Came just in Sleep the nick of sound. time because this last weekend my old lower back was doing it, decided to do its thing, and uh, I was glad we had the salve. Julie was kind enough to give me a great 
uh, CBD from the gods, salve rubbed down on my lower back, and that really made a difference. Anyhow, so yeah, I was pleased with that. Yeah, and then um, you know, doing the doing what I do is you know, I for this before I go to bed, what I do is I take about two thirds of the dropper full under my tongue, just last thing before I'm ready to go to bed. And then I leave it under there for a minute or so and just kind of let it do its own thing. And usually, usually I then will sleep like a baby. All right. That's yeah. great. Which is yeah. so, yeah, I'm definitely going to make sure I have a good supply of this for the field trip. Yeah. And that's the Apollo oil. This, that's, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Once again, CBD from the gods.com. And uh, the promo code is RC ships free for free shipping. Right. And as you know, I've, I've pointed out, you know, it's, it's got my, it's an older picture, that picture of me, but it was, uh, I think it was taken back in the, probably the 1980s. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. you, used to, you used to be an archer, huh? <laughs> yeah, they used to call me Archie. Archie, <laughs> was it, was Archie the, Carlson. Was it the 980s or 1980s? <laughs> Yeah. Well, the 90s, that was a previous, that was a previous incarnation. Yeah, he meant 80s AD. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the 80s AD. Yeah, right there, just at the, the verge of the collapse of the Roman Empire, I was. That's right, yeah. Well, no, that was an even earlier incarnation. <laughs> 1980. <laughs> okay, I got 1980. it. 1980. <laughs> yeah, when you hear, generally, Kyle, when you hear somebody's making reference to the 80s, it's usually the 1980s. Okay. okay. So, all right. Hey, you learn something new every day on Cosmographia. Yeah. So let's get back to those uh, depo- those valley valley trains. Okay. This valley is a trains. new term we're we're introducing here. A valley train. So if we're you, checking the dip of the valley trains. We're yeah, we're checking the dip of the valley trains. All right, Kyle. All right. Song title. <laughs> that is a good song title. <laughs> Checking the dip of the valley trains. Yeah. All right, Kyle. By the time of the field trip, you're going to have a song for us, right? <laughs> All Checking right. The dip. So anyhow, <laughs> picture this. You got a prominence, a promontory sticking out. Some A term that we would use. Here's another term. I think we've introduced this term. An interfluve. Right? Yeah. You've got the fluves. Picture the two tributary valleys coming down, and then you've got the interfluve, man, the interfluve. So, um, okay, so you got the interfluve, this prominence, prominence kind of projecting out into the valley. And if you got a water flow by it, and that, that sediment is, I mean, that water is loaded with sediment. What happens is in the lee side or down current side of that, prominence projecting out there will be a deposit it'll leave right there in that lee side a a, a train of depositional material and depending on the volume of the flow the amount of sediment all of that will determine the mass of of this valley train but basically it's just a trending off um I'll, i'll make a little i'll even get fancy here like this so here we have, let's see if we can, ah, yeah. So there's a prominence, right? So let's do it this way. And all right, so, okay, let's suppose that this is a stream channel and the water is flowing this way and you've got this prominence, everything, okay. Stay out in the valley. I'm re- everything's reversed. You want to try the whiteboard? We might be able to do this. Uh, well, uh, let's Zoom has give a it a try. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, click on your share screen, I think. Yeah, screen. and then open up the share screen window and click whiteboard. Try that out. And okay, then use your let's mouse see what draw. happens. Whiteboard. No, I'm getting kind of nervous now. Okay, yeah, bro. look at this. Yeah. Awesome picture. Hey, all right, man. <laughs> all right, so let's, first of all, we've got an interfluve, man. Okay, so this is like a hill kind of extending out. And then this is the flow coming in this way. And let's say it's coming down this way. And over here we have 
you know, more mountains or whatever. And we probably got some more, um, you know, so like we got tributary. So like say there's a stream coming up here this way and okay. the water flow is this way, right? Let me see if I can get an arrow in there. But you got the picture, right? Right. So now yeah. let's say you got a bunch of water flowing from left to right here and it's loaded with sediment. So what happens is in the downstream side of this prominence, you get this valley train that's trending off. Oh, uh, okay. That's just material deposited behind that hill. Yes, where exactly. Where the water has slowed you got down it. in the you flow. You got it. Material okay. bu deposited behind it. You can see this effect almost any creek or river, particularly after a, 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 a storm or a, a rainfall or a flood. So this is your valley train right here. And um, so you got the picture now, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. Then the other thing was I was talking about was, you know, you'll have water that will back flood up into the tributaries. Okay. Right? Yep. And then until it reaches whatever the, the, the depth is, in this case of the Clark Fork, it's 4,200 feet above sea level. And then that water will, will reach its limit. It'll pause there for some indeterminate length of time, and then it'll flow back out. So what will happen is you actually end up, let's put it this way, you end up with two flows going the opposite direction. An inflow and then a, 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 or you can think of it as an outflow from the main channel and then an inflow back into it. Okay. But for now, white pine gravel pit that we were just looking at is part, was part of a valley train, right? So the highway goes along and you can pull off and they were actually quarrying and mining this gravel that was part of this, this valley train. Yeah. Um, so cool. we'll stop share here and let's go back. Um, the podcast is forever changed, folks. We got a whiteboard. We got a whiteboard now. Cool. I'm going to, I was really fun. Um, let's see. Where was it? Okay. So, yeah. Here we are looking at a, uh, a, a gravel pit into the Dry Creek Valley train. This is actually the Dry Creek gravel pit um you see bradley here checking the dip um here we have our old friend bill phillips taking a closer look now what do you notice here kyle do you see the dip i do which way was Looking the current flow from right to left you got it man from right to left now i took this picture of bill and when i took this picture I was facing the southwest. So what's wrong with this picture? So the flow is to the southeast? Yes. In and fact, both, the the flow... both in the white pine gravel pit and this dry creek. Except that we're supposed to be looking at something going that drained north northwest. This is so a flow, a very substantial sediment-laden flow flowing up towards Missoula towards <laughs> Missoula. Yes. Okay. Perhaps you would problem. be kind enough to explain to me, Kyle, what the hell is going on there? Uh, commentary bombardment, whoa. With a bunch of ice, whoa, 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 whoa. and there was a catastrophic filling of, uh, Lake Missoula. <laughs> Across I think, I think we I think we did a little bit of a, li a, a little sequence of leapfrogging there, but <laughs> Mystery solved, folks. Po Mystery solved. Podcast, podcast over. over. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We, we're done. We made our point. So, yeah. Now, here's the interesting thing. Let's see what some of the geologists have to say about this. Um, ah, there we go. Right there we see Dry Creek Gravel Pit. I'm standing there looking in this direction. The, the, the flow that deposited that was flowing southeast when it should have been flowing northwest. So Damn it. I have been trying to wrap my brain around that literally for over 20. This was that picture there was taken in 1998. So we went there knowing that this was an anomalous situation. And then later we went 
found another one, white pine gravel pit, that basically confirmed what was we saw here, was that you had a huge flow going the wrong direction, going into the basin of Lake Missoula. So where is that coming from? Well, as it turns out, there are some clasts, remember the term clasts, some of the rocks that are within those had their origin, where do you think? Canada. Purcell Trench. Okay. Purcell Trench, yeah. So let's see here. Uh, White Pine Gravel Pit. Here's what uh, from Field Trip Guidebook uh, by Roy Breckenridge, who we went and I interviewed him in 1998 in his office uh, in um, in Idaho uh, at Moscow, Idaho, at the university there, because he had done most of the field work on the Clark Fork in the area where the ice dam was presumed to be. And I specifically, this was we were going to investigate, I specifically wanted to know where can we go to actually find where water and ice came together just prior to the, let's say, the first outbreak. What I came away with was he couldn't tell me. And then he began to actually express doubts about the whole idea. I mean, already he's having questions. In the literature, I didn't see any of those questions coming up other than what you're about to read right here or what I'm about to read to you. Um, so this is from the Glacial Lake Missoula and the Channel Scab Land, Missoula, Montana to Portland, Oregon, Field Trip Guidebook, Roy Breckenridge Leader, July 20th through 26th, 1989. The White Pine Gravel Pit, quoting, the White Pine Gravel Pit is located approximately three kilometers south of Highway 200 on the White Pine Creek Road. The deposit is about 100 meters above the valley. The gravel pit presently exposes over 50 meters, which is what, about 160 feet, 50 meters. It is, uh, yeah, 164 feet. Uh, the gravel pit presently exposes over 50 meters of gravel section. This feature is located at the mouth of the tributary valley and trails southeast from the valley side in an opposite direction to the present Clark Fork River and the flows emptying Glacial Lake Missoula. Directional indicators show the feature was deposited by currents moving in a southeastward or up valley direction. Um, now, let's jump ahead here. No, same year, but this is Geological Guidebook for Washington and adjacent area, adjacent areas. Prepared for the 85th annual meeting of the Cordilleran Section Geological Society of America. It met on May 8th through the 11th in 1989. This was published by the Washington Division of Geological and Earth Resources, Information Circular Number 86. So this is from the guidebook now. The gravel deposit is at the mouth of Dry Creek. Uh, so there it is again, right? The landform trails southeast from the valley side in a direction opposite that of the flow of water that emptied Glacial Lake Missoula. This pit is at an elevation of 18, 817 meters, more than 125 meters above the floor of the valley. So 125 meters above the floor, so that's going to be um, right at 410 feet. So we know right there the water was above 410 feet in order to deposit this flow, deposit this valley train. Um, the four set beds are several meters high and dip eastward. Clasts are poorly rounded and some cobbles are striated. Although most clasts are Precambrian belt metasediments derived locally, and here's the key, some clasts of granite and diorite exposed in and adjacent to the Purcell Trench are present. So we've got granites and diorites in those deposits that come from the Purcell Trench. 
goes on to say there, all of the major drainages on the south side of the Clark Fork Valley between here and Trout Creek, more than 30 kilometers to the southeast, have similar deposits. Known occurrences of these deposits are restricted to the south side of the Clark Fork Valley, opposite the source areas of ice on the north, just where ice marginal channels would be expected. If these features represent ice marginal outwash deposited in Lake Missoula, then the ice extended much further up the Clark Fork Valley than previously recognized, nearly to Thompson Falls. And the late phases of glacial Lake Missoula drained quiescently enough to leave them preserved. Yeah, boy, look at that. And this is a good one. This is Graham Hancock at the Dry, Dry Creek Gravel Pit. Well, you can see those sweeping four sets very clearly. There's, and there's Bradley up there for scale. Wow. Yeah. So look it at, does look like some of the flows, at least some of that on top, was more flat or maybe going in the other direction, maybe. Than the, it's uh, hard to the, tell from this angle. The, the angle kind of yeah, throws okay. it off a little bit. But yeah, clearly from this, it looks like there were just sweeping pulses one after another. Yeah. Totally ch fully charged with sediment. Just uh, so, you know, okay. So now I'm trying to fit this into the whole chronology of these events. And, and you know, what, what do you think? I mean, okay. But and, and notice it's on the south side. And the idea, as they were pointing out, is, well, the north side is going to have the ice coming from it, right? So maybe the north side of the Clark Fork is actually, you know, insulated by a glacier mass. And so now you would have an ice marginal flow coming along the south of it. But then the idea uh, that, that, that he then says, get this. Okay, let me, let, let's go back to the. I'll stop share here. And then let's go back to what he says here. Um, he says, um, if these features represent ice marginal outwash, in other words, along the margin of the ice sheet, deposited in Lake Missoula, then the ice extended much farther up the Clark Fork Valley than previously recognized, and the late phases of glacial Lake Missoula drained quiescently enough to leave them preserved. Right. So I'm trying to wrap my head around that scenario and how that fits in with the conventional model. And it drains quiescently 40 to 70 times too, right? It has to drain well, a bunch it, of it times. Would, it, it, one would assume, yeah, see, here's, yeah, it, this is where it gets really complicated. Um, unless, you know, this, this had to have been, well, first of all, if it's. Unless it was just the last time? Yeah, but. The final time? Okay. It would seem like it was the final time, except. The problem with that being the final time is that if the glaciers are fully extended so that they're covering the, the north side of the Clark Fork right here, well, then how could that be at the very end of the floods? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, it's just I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around the, the, the explanation for these valley trains. Um, but are you just trying to, are you saying that because you're trying to make sense of what the standard model is trying to, the story they're trying to tell, or just this in general, in it's general, confusing. I'm trying to, you know, uh, like, first of all, okay. Can't the first question is, can we explain it within the standard model? And if that seems impossible or enormously complex or difficult, we look for something simpler. That's the idea. And. So far, I've not been able to come up with an explanation for this within the conventional model. Because the conventional model would have enough water that ponds behind Wallula Gap that it would be able to deposit a rhythmite um, something like six to 700 feet above the sill of Wallula Gap. So that means that the water has to pond that deep, which means that the discharge capacity of Wallula Gap is, uh, is not... Uh, big enough to convey that volume of water, right? So now you got to get the volume of water out of Lake Missoula all the way down to Wallula Gap, but there's still enough water coming out of Lake Missoula that 
it ponds above Wallula Gap. Now, the discharge capacity of Wallula Gap happens to be just about the same. Um, I think um, um, oh, uh, Connor, Jim O'Connor, and 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 one of somebody he's working, one of his colleagues, calculated the discharge of uh, Wallula Gap, and it's basically right in the same ballpark as Pardee's calculation of the discharge of Lake Missoula that he did it at Eddie Narrows. Okay, well, bear in mind, now see, once that flood surge comes out of Spokane Valley, there's going to be energy losses the whole pathway between the discharge point there and Wallula Gap. So that by the time you get to Wallula Gap, the volume of water should be have diminished considerably. I mean, a very conservative estimate might be that the volume of water is only half because, for one thing, it's losing energy as it, er- as it, as it erodes. For example, as it's coming down, let's say, the, in creating the Cheney Palouse Scablands, it takes an enormous amount of energy to, cr- to erode that material and sculpt that landscape. So all of that energy that's going into creating that erosional landscape of Cheney Palouse is being dissipated from the flood surge. But there has to be enough water at Wallula Gap that you can still just charge over nine cubic miles an hour, right? That's a hell of a lot of water. So here's my point. If, 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 if you're looking at the, at the rhythmites in Burlingame Canyon, and that top rhythmite is, is a discharge of Lake Missoula, that means that rhythmite couldn't have been deposited there unless there was more than nine cubic miles of water per hour pouring into Pasco Basin and trying to force its way through Wallula Gap. So again, my point here is how do you fit all of this together? And now here we've got these valley trains going to the southeast, the wrong direction, the wrong effing direction, right? (laughs) Now, they could have only come, I'm thinking, at the very end of the process, right? Yeah. Because if you had a catastrophic draining and you had, you know, yeah, you got nine cubic six, miles of water. Yeah, they ain't going to be there anymore. Right. So and they're saying they're marginal flows. That, that is that what the explanation is? is yes. Yes. To be, yeah. So now be- then, between the mountains on the south and the glaciers yeah. to the north. Right, That's and a, then it flows towards Missoula, and then once the ice dam breaks, then Missoula flows out nice and gently and doesn't tear those away. That's mm-hmm. that's what he's basically trying to say. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Uh, yeah. Doesn't make sense. I I can't wrap my head around it. And, you know, we went there literally 23 years ago with that same question in our head. Wait, what the hell are these deposits doing there? How do they, how do they fit into the scenario? So the question then becomes ultimately, I mean, the question becomes, what was the ultimate source of that water? Yeah. And if if there's diorites and granites within there, whose origin is the Purcell Trench, then clearly it's coming southward down the Purcell Trench. And, and then that brings us back to the other dichotomy that I mentioned before, which was, and we'll go back to a share screen for this, and I'll go to the map. Um, yeah, I was going to say, because I can't remember the map well enough, but if it was a glacier marginal flow that made those deposits, can was there not was was it able to bring those diorites and stuff from the Purcell Trench along the margin of the glacier to deposit there, or was... Well, does that make sense? Okay, so here's the Purcell Trench. Okay. Now, the idea is all of this area is covered with glaciers. Right. So if we zoom in here, glaciers were basically burying the north side, but not on the south side. In okay. other words, so now if, if, if I were to draw a line, it's maybe, let's say, approximately where the modern-day Clark Fork is. And I said, this is the margin of the ice sheet right there. So now you have this ice marginal trough that's that's basically between the mountains on the south and the glaciers that would be on the north. And the water is coming down and it's being directed in in like this. And then he's saying, well, maybe then the glacier went, instead of stopping here at Cabinet Gorge Dam, it went all the way to Thompson Falls down here. But how does that make sense? Why is it flowing upstream? Instead of going west right there at the, I don't understand. Why is the water staying? Is yeah. just is there is it all ice that way? Well, maybe it did. Because of the Purcell maybe, Trench. See, maybe there was so much water coming out of the Purcell Trench that you had the main flow coming this way, 
But this yeah. was just like a secondary or subsidiary a secondary flow. up up okay a back yeah basically going upstream right uphill yes just like okay. I was talking about earlier yeah okay but I'm still not being able to make sense out of it and going I, uphill fast enough and carrying all that stuff and being able to deposit it with that much tilt it seems. That it was it, it was moving pretty pretty good. I mean, it was a very right. v- large, vigorous current. Right. So, is, yeah. But then after that was deposited, we're assuming that that there couldn't have been any catastrophic flows coming out of the Clark Fork that would have been more than what did we figure four hundred four hundred and ten feet. So, the gravel pit that we just saw is four hundred and say four hundred feet above the valley floor. Okay. So if you had an outflow that was only 200 feet deep, it wouldn't have washed away this gravel deposit, but it was 400 feet deep. It would have, or 500 feet deep. Anyway, if it was 400 feet deep, it would have been lapping right at that level. So presumably it would need to be at least another hundred or 200 feet deeper than that in order to, you know, wash out, carry it away, carry it away. Yeah. So, it seems to me that those deposits had to come at the end of the sequence. But yeah. well, after, only after the major draining of Lake Missoula has taken place. But also, if you have a, if you have a flood in the channel going one direction, it's going to be depositing a bunch of stuff, but also channelizing. It's going to be cutting down, down cutting. So then once it, once it slows down and then starts coming back the other way, it could preserve some of the original deposits at the beginning of the flow that were already now on high ground, right? If it's, if it's cut the channel down deeper, could that be? Well, what I'm kind of thinking, and again, I don't, we haven't looked at this yet, but one of the things that I think would be very revealing is a, uh, a sequence, a, a transect of the Valley here of, uh, of, uh, cores, drill cores. Yeah. Taking drills, you know, coring samples off the floor of the, like, how deep is the sediment here, say, at Heron? Now, we know once we get into this trough here, that that trough there is 1,100 feet deep. Yeah. When did that come into the picture? Yeah, that's really weird. <laughs> I mean, at what point did, 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 did that show up, and how do we factor that into our models of the ice dam? Or was it like, was that some of the uh, supra- glacial flows that were running off the ice sheet and just digging a hole on the edge of the, the at the ice margin. I tend to like think it would have been pool. subglacial flows, very highly pressurized. Yeah. Okay. You guys want oh, to see so what just, the valley looks like there? Sure. Yeah. That little, that little bronze area right on, right north, right above cabinet there, that is a Scotchman's Peak. Right up okay. here. Uh, yeah, right. Okay, yeah, I'll stop here. So, you want to share? Does this also... Does this flow that you're talking about um, tie into the ripple fields we were looking at a few episodes back that are in uh, some of the Lake Missoula back channels or whatever? Oh, yeah, going the wrong they're direction. Going the wrong, they're going to the south, too. Yeah, well, that was Camas Prairie. Camas Prairie, yeah. And that will be our spring trip. So do you think this flow was also part of what caused those ripples? Uh, no, I don't, I mean, I don't see how it could have, I mean, it had, you know, unless this flow, I mean, yeah, it would have to flow through this torturous switch series of switchbacks, constrictions, basins, more constrictions. Yeah, no, I I think that that ripple field was formed by, well, we can circle back, but where we started out looking at the Elmo sublobe over by Flathead Lake and big draw, we've looked at that, but Again, it won't hurt to look at it again because that's connected with, uh, I think that that was a flow that was primarily coming from the flathead lobe. Okay. And this flow so, would have been still, coming this is, from the Purcell Trench lobe. But do you think these were all happening simultaneously anyway, right? I don't know. <laughs> okay. I can't figure out if, if we're just, if your purpose is to l- continue to look at the standard model and try to try to figure out how it works. Well, yeah, Even I mean, you have an idea of like that's totally different, but we're still just arguing the standard model. Well, this, I don't know. Okay, let me put it this way: I, I, there are, to me, some 
some holes and gaps in the standard model. But there's a lot of valuable observations in the standard sure, model, yeah. Yeah. right? So now we've been making observations, kind of thinking, and what I've been doing is kind of zeroing in on the things that don't seem consistent with the standard model. So the first thing I try to do is I try to fit, here's, oh, here's a new piece of evidence, Dry Creek Gravel Pit. Okay, is this going to fit the standard model? It can, you know, and then I look at, wait, wait a minute. No, it's <laughs> going the wrong way, and it's got, you know, provenance of granite and diorite from Purcell Trench. That doesn't really, the standard model doesn't explain that, right? So now we look at an alternative model because, look, I don't pretend that I've got it all figured out. I think I'm ahead of the game only because I'm questioning the standard model and what Brad and I have doing, been doing literally for 23, going on close to a quarter of a century now, is questioning that and basically amassing evidence to suggest that there's another explanation for these floods. Right, all right. And if some, I've been accused of, oh, you know, Randall Carlson says there's just one big flood. Um, no, I've never said that. So I repeat that over and over again. It's way more complicated than that. But what I think we do have to do, which hasn't been done yet, is what we've started, you know, many episodes ago, looking at this evidence of catastrophic melting all over the whole North American ice complex. How does this, what we need is a model, a comprehensive model that encompasses the whole story, the whole scenario of catastrophic melting, which we don't have. And right now, the explanation for the, the Channel Scablands and the Missoula Flood doesn't really integrate. You can't really say, okay, this flood here, uh, one of 40 or 90 floods, correlates with, you know, the draining of Glacial Lake Agassiz or some of the under many underfit rivers we were looking at, you know, up there in, in the Dakota. And the Finger some, Lakes and all of that. All stuff. of that. Yeah. Yes, all of that. That's what I'm trying to get at is we need a comprehensive model that we can look at the Finger Lakes and we can look at the Scablands and we can look at all of these features. And I think that more and more of the evidence is coming down that really we have to look beyond Lake Missoula for the source of these floods, you know, because, which brings us now, oh, Brad, why don't you go ahead and share what you were going to share and then we'll get back to the Yokelops. And yeah, kind just, of, I've got a, a pan of the whole Clark Fork Valley here. Great. From Let's see it halfway uh, halfway band. up that trail to Scotchman's Peak. Okay. Ooh, yeah. Look at that. So that's you know the valley continuing way back there. So that's looking up the Clark Fork. That would be looking southeast. That's, that's southeast up the Clark Fork. Correct. Yeah. So I think the Cabinet Gorge. Dam is right back in here. Uh huh. Behind behind one of these hills. That would make sense. So yeah, hazy day there. Do you know the the elevation of the zone, the drone camera here? I I don't remember. Uh, I'm I'm not up at forty two hundred though. So a little town of Clark Fork down there, and then you're getting around to Pend Oreille. Your your drone is not four thousand two hundred feet above sea level here. Oh, I was thinking where where I was standing. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to I'd have to double check that. Okay, so you're you're probably just above the lake here. I think I'm just above it with the, with the drone. Yeah. So wow. so that's all of this. Incredible. What you see in the background here would have been filled with ice. Right. And then, so the ice marginal, so it's along this bank of mountains over here that White Pine and, and Dry Creek are. So they're trending to the left, showing water flowing. And over here is the bottom of the Purcell Trench. Yeah, if you're So pointing, water coming down the Purcell Trench and flowing this way in the opposite direction to the We draining. can't see your cursor. What a Brad, we can only see Brad's cursor. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> do you want to do you want to look at a map, or you want me to? No, you can point here? out. Yeah. So, so the water. Yeah, those mountains that you see on the background there, on the on the south side of the valley, um, that would so have been the might, southern margin. 
That and might then, be Dry Creek over there. That could be Dry Creek right in there, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting it. Yep. Finally. Well, Man, what a beautiful area, too, though. Oh, it is. There's a yeah. huge pyramid right there, yeah, too. Yeah, look uh, at that pyramid. Yep. <laughs> well, we have seen some quite remarkable pyramid-shaped rocks that were catastrophically cut. Wow. Yeah. Um, All right. I want to get back to stop share here. Uh, you go to the stop share. <laughs> there at it the is. Bottom. All the way to the top. It's not at the bottom anymore. It's at the top. All right. Double, double Randall's an ex- expert here. on stop share. <laughs> Finally, Randall gets revenge. That's right. You go to the stop share button, Bradley. <laughs> <laughs> well, just for just for laughs, what I'm going to do here is I, I'm going to, I might have shown this, but hell, let's show it again because it's so damn cool. So can you see these two dashed red lines? Yep. This one here, you'll notice I I took that transect through the constricted valley and then where it opens into the basin i did another transect okay so now we'll look at those in profile and so here's your cabinet gorge cross section that's this one here the one to the east and we'll go there now notice here here's your distance across so this is zero here and we'll come across you can see there's the mile one mile mark here's two mile mark and here's 3.2 so from this side to this side is 3.2 miles. Over here on the y-axis, we have the elevation above sea level. So you look right here, you'll see that the bottom of this, the valley, the lowest point, and this would be where the river is, is right here at this transition from the blue to the green bar. And if we come over here, we'll see that's right at 2,200 feet above sea level, right? Now, you see that little dot, that's your 4,000 250 feet above sea level, right? So you've got basically 2,000 feet. So I'm going to put in the water level at that at that uh, datum, 4,200 feet above sea level. And so here's the cross profile of the valley. And then just for some scale, I'll put the Empire State Building in there. So that gives yeah. you a sense of how the enormity of this volume of water moving through this valley here. Like I said, it's around 9.6 cubic miles per hour. Now, then the one the transect to the east is this one right here, where you can see that it's wider, but it's the same thing. Basically, you got the va- bottom of the valley floor just above 2,000 feet, and then you got the water line at 4,200. And what I did was I juxtaposed just a skyline to the proper scale of Atlanta, but it could almost be any large urban area. It could be Washington, D.C. It could be Los Angeles, Seattle, Portland, Chicago, you know, Boston, New York, wouldn't matter. It would be roughly the same. So I'm going to put that skyline of Atlanta in there. So you can see that, for example, a a volume of water of 9.6 cubic miles per hour moving past a given point, isn't going to leave much in its wake. Like, obviously here you can see that a whole infrastructure for a modern city would essentially be completely erased. There would be essentially no trace of it. It would, it, it would basically, all of this building and infrastructure here would essentially have been converted into gravel. And future... Oh, that's crazy. Uh, civilizations would be quarrying that gravel to cast it into concrete and, and make new cities and make yeah. new cities. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's freaking crazy. The steel that's a, that's in those a buildings a lot of would, rain. would quickly rust away within a, you know, a century or two, the steel is going to have rusted away. Certainly within a thousand years. So yeah. And then we get to Lake Pend Oreille. And so this was where the ice dam was. And this is the lake itself looking south, southwest. So the outflow would have been down in this direction here. So, yeah, this would have been right there on the north side of the lake. It's quite a beautiful lake, actually. And then so this imagine was, how, how long it's got to rain and how much to fill up that lake. 
Well, yeah. To, to bury your city. Yes. That's, that's yeah. insane. There's no way. Well, and see, here's the point. When you're looking at stuff like this, this is like the rubble of whatever it used to be. It didn't start out like this. It was once bedrock, you know, it was once solid mass of stuff that got ripped up, pulverized, swept along, and then deposited. Look at this. This is a road cut. This is a, one of the giant ripples that uh, is below Lake Ponderé. And actually, you can see there's another one down here. There's a whole train of these, and the road cut slices right through them. And, you know, let's say 1,000, 5,000 cars. I don't know. Probably 1,000 is closer because this is out. You know, it's not in an urban area. But let's say 1,000 cars drives by this road every day. How many of them do you think realize, oh, look there, honey, look, a transect of a giant current ripple? <laughs> probably not. None. <laughs> probably none. Right. Yeah. Most people drive right by it, completely oblivious to the story that's hidden right in the landscape. Think back to the white pine gravel pit. Think back to the dry creek gravel pit, right? Well, we saw that because they're quarrying the gravel. But then look above it where... You know, what did you have? You had forest growing on it. So, you know, you could have, you know, people walking, you know, hunters, you know, um, explorers, whatever, whoever, you know, hikers, campers, without having the slightest clue of what's under their feet. Yeah. How does it feel being responsible for, you know, maybe thousands of people being able to look at piles of dirt and have their minds blown. <laughs> hey, it's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's pretty, pretty cool. Good. Yeah. 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 I've never looked at a, at a wall of dirt the same ever since, uh, yeah, you know, starting to right. learn this stuff. Well, you know, yeah, I would have, yeah, there was a time in my life when I would have just, you know, a wall of dirt is a wall of dirt. You know, a hill is just a hill, but at some point you begin to realize that no, no a wall more. of dirt, you know, tells a whole story of the hill. Tell you a story. Yeah. Exactly. There is. There's a whole and, and and look look at the look at the dip on this right here. You see very clearly. Yep. Where was that current coming from, left or right? Coming from the left. Coming right? from the left. Yeah. Exactly. So, I'm gonna stop share there and then go to a back to this. Let's see. So, okay. So when it comes back to okay. The question of Brad was just raising, saying it sure did have to rain a lot. Um, and the answer to that is, yeah. Um, let's see, so bring back to modern lakes. I mean, that's the whole that's the whole freaking skyline of Atlanta, and the tall and the and the tallest building was not even halfway or right at halfway. Right. Yeah. Right. Right to the depth, and we decide it's like a thousand sixty feet or something. Yep, a thousand sixty feet. Yeah, so it's right at halfway. Yeah. Okay, so here's Maureen. This is from a, one, an old journal article, right? Uh, review of catastrophic. Well, from not that old, two thousand, but a review of catastrophic drainage of Moraine dammed lakes in British Columbia. So here we have. A moraine dammed Nos Nostatuco Lake in the southern coast mountains of British Columbia, as it appeared in July 1977, photographed by J.M. Ryder. The large moraine impounding the lake was constructed during the Little Ice Age. And here is, you can see down here is the moraine. Well, so this, this is interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one, it shows us, and, and through examples like this, there's multiple examples like this. In fact, I think the next one is, yeah. So here's Queen Bess Lake, and it's breached right here. Little Ice Age Moraine in 1998, one year after failure, an ice avalanche from Diadem Glacier, which is right here, um, triggered a large displacement wave that overtopped and breached the end of the moraine. Hmm. This is what happened there. But but you can see here, the moraine was this right here. And you see, here's the breach point. You see that? So moraine here, moraine here. And then apparently there was a, 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 what did they say? That it was an ice avalanche off the end of the glacier 
caused this um like a tidal wave in yeah, there. It, we, yeah. What they're referring to as a displacement wave. A displacement wave. That came down, washed over the top of the moraine here, then cut down enough that the lake that was filling this basin here could begin flowing out. And as soon as it did that, that moving water became erosive and quickly cut down a channel and then just breached the moraine right here. Yeah. Um, and then you can see that it, here's a whole load of deposits that as the, and, and what this deposit is telling us here is that initially the, the, the drainage of the lake is going to be basically, uh, it's going to start out, there's going to be the, what you'd call the flood hydrograph, which is the, the, um, it would means first there's a smaller discharge, then it gets bigger really quick, and then it tapers off. And then as it tapers off, it's losing energy. And so all of this finer sediment gets sort of choked up just above the breach point, right? If you if you were to go into the breach point, you'd find that, you know, the, the coarse stuff has been washed out, and you can see this is finer stuff in the final drainage and subsequent drainage of the lake, the residual lake cuts this this little channel that you see right here. Okay. But so now here's here's two things to 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 realize here and how this might apply to thinking about Lake Missoula. Okay. This is a little ice age mooring. So what that means is that during the peak of the little ice age, and I don't have a date on this, but I'm guessing this would have probably been early 1800s, right? That means that the glacier that ends right here at the shore of the lake ended down here at the moraine. Got it? So that was its maximum extent, it, it, the largest this it got, and created this moraine. So by looking at the terminal moraine, you, you can tell how big the glacier got. So what this was is the zone of ablation where the glacier melts away. And then the zone of accumulation is going to be up in here somewhere. So again, you got to remember that there's two types of of glacier mass, um, you know, active glaciers and inactive or stagnant glaciers. Active ace, uh, glaciers are, are like slow moving rivers, and they're continually being fed in the gathering ground, and that's feeding in. And so, and here you probably got. I'm guessing you probably got two glaciers flowing together here. And then you've got a lot of dirty stuff that's probably fallen off the edges of the cliffs and landslides and stuff that's been incorporated into the glacier. But here's the thing. You got a lake here. This is a pro-glacial lake, right? So this lake formed because the glacier receded or melted back. So if the glacier was all the way out here to the moraine, in fact, if you look right down here, this was probably a discharge point because clearly you would have, you know, seasonal melting and that melting would flow beyond the moraine, right? But then when the glacier begins to recede, it creates more meltwater, right? And so this meltwater here was then formally occupied by ice. So for this lake to form, the ice has to recede. And now we have a lake that's going to be some combination of meltwater and presumably precipitation, but it's probably mostly meltwater created by the receding glacier. And if the climate were to cool again, the glacier would start to expand, this lake would disappear, and the ice would then, you know, fill up this whole area. Same same type of a deal right here. You see the ice now is is back up here, but at one point it filled this whole area right here. So this during the Little Ice Age, the glaciers, remember, the glaciers got bigger during the Little Ice Age than they'd been in like 10,000 years. So in the last 150 years or 200 years, the ice receded from here back to here. And in the process of receding, it created its proglacial lake. It didn't. So, so, so what I'm getting at here is notice that the, the recession, the withdrawing of the ice directly correlates with the forming of a lake. Okay, so I will end there. Okay, so we'll have a little discussion and that will conclude this episode, but you see what I'm getting at now. Now, in the case of Lake Missoula, what have you got? You've got 
600 cubic miles of proglacial lake, which is thousands of times bigger than anything we've looked at in terms of modern examples of proglacial lakes, right? Where did that water come from? Like Brad raised the question, well, that's a hell of a lot of rain, or it's a hell of a lot of melting, or some combination thereof. But if it's melting, it's the ice melting, right? So if the ice is melting, if it's ablating, well, what's it doing? It's receding. It's, it's disappearing, isn't it? Yeah. Now, if you're going to have all of those valleys filled with water, wouldn't you first have had to have them filled with ice? And then that ice melts. In other words, just imagine instead of Missoula being filled with water, it's filled with ice. Well, okay, so now you melt 600 cubic miles of ice and there you get the lake. But nobody's ever said that. Nobody's ever said that, you know, that the whole Missoula basin was filled with ice. I mean, the Flathead Lobe basically terminated there at Polson at the southern end of Flathead Lake. Yeah. So, so all of that area was not filled with ice. So where did the water come from? And how do you get that much water without melting a whole lot of ice? But if you melt a whole lot of ice, how do you get that same ice? See, here, here's where we get, I think, into, the, into the, the paradox here. Okay, because you get 600 cubic miles of water, it bursts through the ice, and it's going to completely, you cannot have 9.6 mile, cubic miles of water moving through this valley without taking everything with it. In other words, after a discharge of that scale, there's not going to be any ice dam left. So you have to grow that ice back. In other words, you have to, that, and, and, you know, we need to talk about the different kinds of, of ice. You know, it's going to be a cold base or a tempered based ice. Well, cold base ice moves very slowly. You know, Glacier ice moves by two, two factors, basal sliding or interior movement of the ice mass itself, right? Basal sliding means that, you know, you've got a water layer lubricating the bottom of the glacier. But if, if and, and that's typically a tempered glacier. Well, the presence of all that water, if it's rainfall, then that's clearly suggesting a tempered climate. Otherwise, it's all going to be snowfall, and instead of all of that lake forming, you're just going to have more glaciers. You don't have a polar climate there, right? Then you have a flood. Let's say it sweeps out all of the, 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 the Rathdrum Prairie, the Spokane Valley. All of that is clean device. Because remember, Victor Baker, he measured the peak discharge in the, spoke, in the Rathdrum Prairie, which is below percent of Lake Ponderade, and he came up with almost double. See, so there was another inconsistency that to me can be explained by saying, okay, at some point there were two flows, Clark Fork, Purcell Trench coming together right there. Okay. But again, if you've got, whether it's nine or whether it's 16 or 17 cubic miles of water coming through there, moving down Rathdrum Prairie through the Spokane Valley, there's no ice dam anymore. So now that ice dam, let's say that it's, it's truncated just above Pond Ray. Well, now in order to create another 2,000-foot deep lake, the ice has to be half a mile thick there. Well, that means if the ice is half a mile thick there, the, the, the toe of that ice dam you know, is not going to be there. It's going to be way down valley, typically using standard marginal profiling, it's going to be 25 or 30 miles away. In other words, because it starts at basically nothing and then gets thicker and thicker as you go up, up glacier, right? So now it has to start from nothing and be half a minimum of half a mile thick at the mouth of Clark Fork. So now in order to get that second lake forming, You've got to picture something, okay, the ice is advancing, and then the lake is filling at the same rate that the ice is advancing. But if the ice is advancing, then where's the water coming from? How is the lake filling? Yeah, exactly. So, it, it, yeah, I don't know if I, you know, it gets, it's, it's complicated to get these ideas to try to fit them all together. But I, I hope people, if they're thinking about what I'm saying and listening to this, will begin to see what I think is the problems with the standard model. 
Yeah, I think you've laid it out pretty clearly. I, I'm uh, I'm buying it. <laughs> what I keep thinking about that rain, though, to have that much rain, it's got to be so warm. There's no way that the ice is going to be solid enough to hold back the the lake anywhere near the depth they say it was. So I, that's why I say it's insane. Right. It, just, it makes no sense, and it, it never has since we've been going out there 23 years. I don't get it. <laughs> Well, which brings us back to, you know, and next week maybe we'll look at some of the rhythmites um, and talk about that a little bit, um, some of the other things, and then, you know, maybe try to come up with some way of tying this in with, see, because, again, the point that I keep trying to make is we have to be looking at this within the much larger context of what brought the entire North American continent catastrophically out of the ice age and produced gigantic meltwater floods virtually at every point of discharge around the ice sheets. See, and I, I don't think we're going to understand the formation of the Scablands or even the formation of Lake Missoula. And I, I continue to use the lake, but, you know, we quoted from David Alt last episode where he's saying, where's the evidence of a lake? You know, where's the fossils that we should yeah, find? Yeah, it's too, it's, it, yes, there are no other signs of lake except for strand lines. Yeah, except they, the they, strand there's no lines. Foss, there's no fossils, there's no lit varves, there's none of the other stuff you would expect to see with a long-standing lake. Yes. Yeah. That was David Alt's point. Right. I Yes, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. So what it kind of leads to is I think I think we're at a point where we're le- it's legitimate to try to rethink this whole process and again expand our thinking to encompass a much bigger and larger event of which this is a regional expression of a much larger event. And ultimately I think we have to go north. We have to go up to the Cordillera and Ice Sheet to look for the source and I think we have to be looking at some kind of a very rapid accelerated catastrophic melting of the Cordillera and ice sheet ultimately to explain this. And it may have been accompanied by intense rainfall. Yeah. I think we have to look at a, at a much bigger, more complex catastrophe whose origins are to the North, not just the breaking of an ice dam at Pend All right. All right. Good stuff. Yep. So, yeah, we want to thank people for coming over and watching us on HowTube. No, oh, yes. Hopefully by the time this this episode comes out, we're going to be fully on to HowTube and YouTube's only going to have uh teaser short segments and uh Yep. people are signing up and uh watching us on the HowTube and buying themselves a t-shirt like Mr. Mike's got there in that nice blue. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. We're getting the hats. Yes, all of that helps us. And yeah, yeah, think about, you know, I guess the tour is for uh, September is filled, but, you know, then there's going to be a, what are we looking at, next June? Is that what Darren is? Yeah, but still. We're thinking about, yeah, the the Scablands 2, which would be uh, western Montana in June. Uh Early June, I think. Yeah, but still, if you're interested in the September tour, you know, I don't get know on the wait list. Yeah, put send Darren an email anyway. You know, so has Darren yeah. made reservations at Quinn's Hot yeah, Springs? Yeah, he's put the he's put the calls in. Yep, uh-huh. to get that started. So he said they were mostly they're they're really booked on weekends now, but six months out, yeah, they're 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 open. So we'd take over you know two thirds of the place at least again, like the other resort. It's so yep. late. Um, oh, that would be awesome. But yeah, you know, ideally we're going to do another uh, Southwest trip though in the spring, right? If, uh, you know, April. So that one's just starting to get gelled. So more info on that one coming. Mm -hmm. All right. There you go. All right, right. guys. Thank you, Randall. And I'll just mention, just in case people don't know, Kyle and I have our own podcast. Oh yeah. Those of the serpent. So if you ever want to, you know, check us out. Well, it's, I think it's a great compliment to this website. I'm a website to this podcast. Yeah, it is. And a lot lot of of stuff you guys get into. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, because what you guys are getting into is of interest. Um, absolutely yeah yeah and and a lot of it overlaps with what we're doing here That's and right. i just want to mention that you know we're we're creating a sort of a, a we're setting the stage we're then getting into like we'll start getting into some geomythology where yeah. start by dissecting some of the myths and stories that have come down to us that can i think can actually shed light on the interpretation of these events and you know 
I mean, a lot of people that watch us already know that all over the world are legends of these extraordinary floods. And I think we're in a position now where we can say, okay, this is not just some little local flood that got blown way out of proportion through, you know, multi-generations of telling or, you know, exaggerated, but it really is, uh, you know, stories of floods that go way beyond anything within our recent historical experience. And those That's flood right. stories tie in with the whole narrative of what may have actually happened in the past. Um, because if we find out that there's a literal reality behind the flood stories, then does that have implications for some of the other stories? Yeah, it opens the door on the other stories. It does. It sure. opens the doors on, on the other stories. That's right. Yeah. Well, Fantastic. All right, guys. Just to add in, yeah, sorry. It's, uh, it's an unpleasant topic, but it's something we got to keep bringing up. The word is getting out. Uh, yeah. The continued disassociation of Randall Carlson and Sacred Geometry International. Okay. So it may still look like. Randall is involved in that, promoting that, or earning money from that, but that is not what not what's happening. So no, um, it's an unauthorized sales of my material. It was an original agreement that a, a simple sharing of revenue fifty fifty, but somewhere the administrator decided that uh, it was all his. So that and yeah. a number of other reasons, many other reasons actually, I had to walk away. Very disappointing right. turn of events, but I had no choice. That's right. So, so RandallCarlson.com. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Come to RandallCarlson.com. And uh, yeah, any, anything that's that's purchased or donated to Sacred Geometry International, none of that is going to Randall. That's right. And hasn't for several years now. So uh, trying to spread that wide so people understand that. Thank, yep. thank you, Brad, for bringing that up. And if you donate to the Patreon for Cosmography or Randall Carlson, that all goes to Randall. Yes, that is Absolutely. going, by Randall. the way. Yeah. And I do share it with these guys to some extent. Brad gets some of it. <laughs> Laura's gotten some of it. Yeah. Appreciate oh, yeah. It. And yeah. <laughs> I got People got to know also that we've got Laura on board doing our social media and art and graphics and things. That's right. Uh, a very uh, a great asset for our efforts here. Yeah, absolutely. Many thanks, Laura. Yeah. All right, guys. All right. Yep. Good stuff. Yep. Yep. Do it again. again. Good night. Final thought: nine point six cubic miles an hour is thirty eight thousand four hundred Empire State Buildings an hour. Just to let you know, <laughs> I did the math. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a lot of Empire State. That's buildings. That's a lot of That's Empire lot. State Buildings per hour. That's right. I'm gonna have to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Good night. Good night. Okay. Good night. Do math. Good night.